So I have 15 minutes and John has 15 minutes as well. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Started. Um, <clears throat> okay, I've introduced myself earlier and then I suppose John can introduce himself uh, later on. Um, I'm just going to launch straight into it for t the sake of time. The Rock Art Scotland in South Africa, or RASA project, was a seed-funded pilot initiative under the aegis of the strategic partnership that exists between the University of Edinburgh and the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, where I'm based. It was funded half and half, 50-50 by each institution. The project requires some background because it does not exist in isolation, and indeed one of the main points is that such projects need to be part of a wider scheme to build on the momentum already created. So this is one of many uh, uh, parts that all feed into one another. I hope that comes across. So th these are the mountains where I work. So you can see what, the, what surveying that area is like when you have to walk a lot with no path, walk along those uh, cliff lines, one, two, three, four levels. So there's a lot of, and the, the peaks up there are 3,000 meters. Next slide. Oh, yeah. uh, the work we're presenting today is situated in the mountains of the former apartheid era homeland of the Trans Sky, where a lot of people already lived, but then a whole load of other people were just put during apartheid. And so they, there were too many, too much live, too many uh, livestock, and too much overgrazing, and they lost their topsoil over the over the period of about sort of fifty years from from um, nineteen forty eight onwards. It's just a one of the many, many devastating things that happened in this country. Uh, which is now part of the Eastern Cape province. So we don't say Trans Sky anymore. Uh, the Joke, Parby and Alfred and Zoe districts are known for their marginal, mountainous location, their deep rural communities and their rich and varied cultural groups. Uh, Amakhlubi, Amakosa, Basutu, Baputi, Amabaka and Amazulu. The project was conducted in collaboration with the local Mechludin Community Trust, who helped select team members from representative groups and facilitated the remuneration. People in rural communities, especially in post-apartheid South Africa, are seldom able to contribute to archaeological projects that are essentially investigations of their own past. There are hundreds of rock paintings and engravings in the subcontinent. For our Speaking of databases, which we had earlier, our uh, RARI Database Sarada has 300,000 images from all over Africa and elsewhere, so it's a biggie. Uh, many of them in traditional, communally owned land and in difficult high mountain terrain. While some aspects of heritage are alive and well, rock art heritage is often overlooked because it's not sufficiently valorized in, apologies for, for using the word valorized, but it's the nearest approximation we can think of, in the eyes of the local community and wider public. The RASA project was implemented to help redress this problem. The approach taken was to stimulate change in the way that local community groups view and value their own heritage, how they present rock art sites to visitors, and how this activity can help create economic and social opportunities for a, with a focus on how rock art sites can be safeguarded for future generations. The project set out to achieve, one, the archaeological research goal of locating rock art sites, Two, recording of sites by local groups using accessible digital photography and enhancement. And three, the heritage management goal of valorizing rock art, partly through income generation. These challenges were addressed by consulting with local communities and putting together a team of local field technicians equipped with low cost rock art enhancement software and remunerating them for their time. Uh, just a little note for uh, because we're in Edinburgh, I chose the contact rock art, because that's actually my specialty, is the rock art of the last, uh, of the 19th century, uh, to play up on the idea of the border reavers that you get here in the sort of Jedburgh, Melrose, Selkirk area, and to, to reave or to be bereaved is to have, lo to have lost something, and many of the colonial era images we find in this area uh, are concerned with the active resistance to the colonial project by means of uh, stock theft, so people were basically conducting a guerrilla campaign to lift stock and send these colonists back where they came from um, uh, by people who had, were bereft of their own lands. 
Um, communities are in danger of losing their rocket heritage before it can be recorded and protected, in some cases even being damaged when it is protected. But in order to protect the rock art, it has to be valued. And so it is a challenging task to find ways of understanding value, especially if one is an outsider. So we don't know what value these things hold for the people that we're talking to. Uh, South African scholar Ndukiaki Ndlovu um, has a position that South African archaeology is not citizen friendly because of its inability to sustain modern livelihoods. So it's very unlike here where you're engaging with communities who are very often people who are doing it in their spare time or it's as a hobby or something like that. There's no such thing over that side. Um, I.e. you can't have custodians if they're not paid or benefiting somehow. However, there are many instances where the commodification of heritage, especially when it's yoked to development, has resulted in disappointment and disaffection, leading some to perceive extractive development, such as mines, as preferable serving the cause of economic empowerment better than the archaeological site. So they'd rather have a mine, because we would get money from that. Therefore, one has to acknowledge the imperative of both job creation and engaged overseeing of heritage management. The best way to do this, we argue, is with skills transfer and the training and ch credentialing, another terrible word, but you have to use it, credentialing of community archaeologists. Um, to decolonize the way that archaeology is done, we have to build capacity in the potential employees on CRM projects, as opposed to simply hiring African labor from the nearest village, which is how everything has been done hitherto. This is relatable through the roads must fall and then the fees must fall movements in South Africa, which prompted us to suggest the hashtag heritage must fall movement, i.e. the way that heritage is done has to completely change. This was proposed at the time of the fees must fall movement and written in 2016, although it was frustratingly published in 2021 by Rachel King, Charlie Arthur and me. So it's something of a manifesto and it fits nicely with a the revolution theme for TAG, I think. RASA is one of several affiliated projects, all of which feed into a be and benefit from the pool of local community archaeologists that underpin the Lusutu Heritage Network, or LHN. Trainees turned technicians have organized themselves into this network, which is an independent cooperative adv advocacy group for Lesotho's heritage and heritage professionals. Okay, so that's the nation, this the kingdom of Lesotho there, which is a, 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 like an island, mountain island state within South Africa but it is a, it's a sovereign state. And it, but it now includes adjacent districts in South Africa. The initiative began with the World Bank funded Metal on Cultural Resource Management Project in Lesotho with Charlie Arthur from 2009 to 2012, training local community members to become archeologists and ultimately become accredited field technicians, actually becoming archeologists in their own right, local community members. Um, Technicians from this project then came to South Africa to engage in the training of members of the Matatiele Archaeology Rock Art or MARA program with me 2011 and 2012 running all the way through to 2021. They've been engaged on multiple projects in the region gaining in experience and reputation as they go. Field technician CVs are uploaded to the Heritage Network site so that commercial companies and academics can see which people have the skills required for forthcoming projects. Under normal circumstances, we would survey for sites with our local field technicians and record them ourselves. However, the premise for RASA was that local survey teams headed by previously trained field technicians would record rock art themselves using tough smartphones enabled with the D-Stretch app. They would then be able to report discoveries either directly from the field or at their leisure uh, when they had airtime and, and reception enough to do so project partners and field technicians themselves <clears throat> from, with it, from within the community selected the potential recruits to become community rock art custodians and trainee technicians. The technicians and trainees... <laughs> technicians and trainees, Pusileto Lecheko and Sani Mohapi, Tsepiso Leoatle, Tabatani Chaka, Tando Msutu and, and Tlantla Hadi were active throughout most of 2021, some of them even into 2022, recording sites using D-Stretch and sending us the results. So that's an Okitel tough smartphone, uh, which is sort of, you know, you've got the adverts, you the freeze it in a block of ice and then they set fire to it and then they drop it from the building or whatever. But it's, it's just got D-Stretch on. 
So this is the stuff that for us is now indispensable. We'll go through a rock shelter and just go de-stretch, de-stretch. De so we can see what it is we're looking at. Some of the stuff is just so faint that you can't see it. So it's helping them see what they're recording. And then from the field, they will sometimes phone me and say, I found a new site. And I can go through it with them and say, have you tried this on D-Stretch and da 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 Mate, Just a game changer. Um, we should mention that all the field technicians are male. Even though we expressed our wishes to have a gender-balanced team, there's an extremely strong perception that women don't go out hiking in the mountains, especially not exploring uncharted territory. It's dangerous. I've been shot at in these areas. No jokes. Um, in similar situations, female technicians and students have always been accompanied by men. So it's a... Uh, yeah. That maybe should be up for, for discussion. The RASA project was also augmented by student projects. Solani Zeta examined uh, the occurrence of graffiti at sites um, and paint removal for medicines to try and develop a more formal strategy for the protection of rock art sites while keeping them open to visitors. Modiechi Chawa, uh, her project assessed the progress of the RASA technicians themselves. And PhD student Mfundo Hlangani is focusing on rock art site, site use by traditional healers. This is the website we created so you can see the results. Rather, John had created. Uh, digital enhancements are nothing new at the Rock Art Research Institute, but the processing used to be done at base camp or later on on our return to Johannesburg. And sometimes we missed faint images. And later, on later discovery in the lab, we had to adjust our records. I'm sure most of you know what that is like. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Whereas in 2021, the field technicians in the RASA team were able to search for images using D-Stretch loaded onto the tough smart smartphones. Um, this is... Uh, this is... Um, Tandu Msutu sending me pictures straight from a rock art site. I actually had a WhatsApp conversation with him, was able to ask him questions about, about it at the time. This is a site discovered by Anklan Khadi. This site was discovered by Pusilezzo Lecerco in 2016, but the images had been too faint to photograph at the time. And this is a site discovered by Tabatani Chakra in the Mount Fletcher team. I'm in discussions with him about visiting the site to record it more thoroughly. Um, and on the website, you can also find the field technicians and trainees. At the top is the team leader for the Matatiele region, Dadi Pusilezzo Lincerco, who has been surveying for rock art since 2011 and is a, an accredited archeologist. He has taken responsibility for the teaching of the two trainees below. The team leader of the Mount Fletcher region, Tabatani Shaka, is something of a local celebrity and uh, Having discovered the largest painted rock shelter in South Africa in 2004, he has taken local school groups to the site, as well as tourists, but without monitored access. This has resulted in unchecked graffiti and damage. Um, and I'll hand over to John. Can I have the talking stick? No. There we go. So when the bell went off was when I was supposed to take over. I've now got two minutes. That's fine. That's fine. Um, Go into that bit, go into that. Okay, so one of the things I just wanted to say was a bit about the emergent findings, why we did this. Um, the money that we got was actually only £5,000. It was a pilot project. It was supposed to be part of the overseas development assistance work that the government used to do here. It was called Global Challenges Research Fund. So it was a pilot for that. Great, we were hit by COVID, and then they cancelled the GCRF fund. So we only managed to do that little bit of, of work. And I just want to say something about where we are now, where we go with the problems we can see with it. Um, so, you know, we had this idea of how can we protect the resource? How can we use rock art to improve the lives of people in the local community? That's the ODA bit. That's the overseas development aid part of it. Um, so I'm just go to the next slide. Yeah, so you've just heard about how we, we, we had the methods of community-led recording of rock art you know, employed some local people, brilliant, so there's some financial benefit going in there. The digital work went very well, training local technicians, lots of students as well, local students involved in this as well. But part of the problem with this is, is, is it's the influence of academics with money. It's a problem with this idea of sort of um, participatory research, it's how participatory is it? 
And um, so fundamentally, the project could be said to be founded on an approach that favors Eurocentric physical conservation of things versus this more African spiritual use of the site. This idea almost of, uh, let's go to the next slide then, preserved heritage versus living heritage. So the way that local groups interact with this heritage might be different to the way that we as academic researchers would want in terms of safeguarding it. And there is an active ongoing engagement with this now with local groups, even though, as Sam said, some of them are displaced groups and displaced peoples and so on. Um, but there's now school groups visit some of the sites. And there was a slide you saw before. I don't think you mentioned it, but it's the, the Titsana Comprehensive sc uh, Secondary School. When they go to visit the site, great, rock art, school kids, rock art, fantastic. And then they write the name of the school next to the rock art and take a photo of themselves next to it. Not ideal practice, but living heritage. So it's the things that people are actually doing in a way. So that's part of a problem with that. The other thing would be, um, you know, we've got scratching. I thought you might have mentioned scratching, but this idea of, you know, uh, local healers going and scratching bits of paint off, um, not because, well, because of the ancestral connection, the idea that that gives power then to, to the paint that they then use in healing. So it's an active tradition. This is going on. It's not conducive to preserving the site. So there's this problem of the Eurocentric view versus the African view. So there's a current use going on. Um, you've, you've, can I go back to my slides? I didn't know you'd be moving my slides around. Where are we? So go to the next one. Yeah, next slide. So how can we use rock art to improve lives of people when we're doing this? So the next, next slide. So it's this idea of community co-creation, which always sounds like a great idea that you're going to go in and you co-create things and you'll think about ideas. Next slide. But as we've already seen, we, we've got this problem of perhaps exclusion of marginalized groups. Whenever you go into a community, you're dealing with the leaders. They're already the leaders. You don't know who you're talking to. You can't really make a judgment about that. Um, we have the gender issue has already been mentioned. It's difficult in, a, in an indigenous situation, a local situation, if it's not seen to be something that's discriminatory to them, then you can't employ that it's discriminatory to you because this is one of the part of the problems, again, of a Western centered view. The ODA research said we had to have gender balance, oh, wait one minute, gender balance teams. Oh, thank you, no, no, uh, gender balance teams, but you can't, really, you can't really do that realistically at this stage. How do we overcome this? I'm not answering that question, I'm just putting it out there. We've got this current use, We've got rock art, tourism and value, which I'm not going to get into other than to say it doesn't really work. And you can ask me why. Um, next thing is inclusive community management plans. What I want to leave you with is this idea that it's nuanced, it's difficult. How do we stop being the great white incomer, come in and protect someone else's heritage? Okay, there's an importance to the whole of humanity, but it's a resource that local communities are already aware of and are using it and understanding it in different ways. And this was the, co the, the comparison we wanted to make to some of the rock art work with uh, Scottish people, where it's generally people of a certain age in a bobbly hat, and it's slightly different to working there. So um, we need more inclusive community management plans because the community aren't involved in it. It's not going to work. So that's where we are. Thank you.